Hello, I'm David Barry, the author of Incredible Journeys, Exploring the Wonders of Animal Navigation. This is a book I wrote about how animals find their way around, including human beings. I'm a navigator myself. I started sailing at a, at a very early age and I was lucky enough to be introduced to the art of celestial navigation when I was 19 years old, sailing across the Atlantic in a, a small yacht. And I was blown away by the fact that it was possible to determine my position in the middle of the open ocean by reference to the height of the sun and the stars above the horizon. It really is an astonishing thing. And it's all thanks to the work of generations of astronomers, mathematicians and instrument makers. Though, of course, we now have GPS, which puts celestial navigation in the shade. But I realised in writing my book Sextant, which is all about how the sextant altered the course of history and made possible the achievements of the early scientific explorers like Cook and Bougainville and Vancouver and the rest of them, I realised then that, of course, all animals with the power of movement, even very small ones, actually need to be able to navigate. We're not the only navigators on this planet. In fact, some of the most impressive navigators are tiny creatures like insects. Even bacteria, single-celled organisms, need to be able to navigate in a simple way. Bacteria need to be able to find their way towards sources of nourishment and they need to be able to avoid dangers like excessive heat or excessive acidity. And some bacteria even have built-in compasses, as I explain in the book. Much of the most impressive research that's been done on animal navigation relates to insects. And I was first exposed to this as a student of experimental psychology a long time ago when I learned about the extraordinary work of von Frisch, Karl von Frisch, the great Austrian uh, behavioural scientist who studied the honeybee and its ability to communicate information about the sources of nectar to its fellow bees by means of an extraordinary dance that it performs. Now that's pretty well known, uh, but less well known is the work of a scientist called Rudiger Weiner, uh, whom I interviewed for the book, who has spent literally 50 years together with his colleagues exploring how another insect, the desert ant of North Africa, navigates. Now I haven't time to go into it in detail, but let me tell you that Vena has revealed that the desert ant, a small creature with a tiny brain, a fraction of the size of our own, I mean it has about 400,000 neurons in its brain and we have maybe 85 billion neurons in ours. Nevertheless, this tiny creature can do things that we can't do without the help of instruments. For example, the desert ant is capable of what we call dead reckoning. It can run out over the featureless salt pans around its tiny nest entrance, which is merely a hole in the ground. It can run around, zigzagging around for hundreds of metres. It then may find a dead insect. And astonishingly, it can then head straight back to the entrance of its nest. This was a puzzle for a very long time until Vena discovered that what these small insects are doing is using the polarised light of the sun to steer by. And more than that, they can even make an allowance for the gradual movement across the sky of the sun during the course of the day. It's changing azimuth, to use the technical term. In addition, the desert ant has a built-in odometer. In effect, it counts its, its steps to work out exactly how far it's gone. And by integrating the information about how far it's gone with the various course changes, every time it changes direction, it can keep track of that by reference to this sky compass of polarized light. That means that it can plot a course straight back to where it came from. That's not 
all there is to desert ant navigation, but you'll have to read the book to find out more about it. It really is an astonishing story. Other insects, too, um, have produced amazing feats for us to wonder at. For example, the nocturnal dung beetle of southern Africa. Now, Eric Warrant, um, an Australian scientist, and his colleague Marie Dacker, who both work at the University of Lund, I interviewed them and learned about their work with these astonishing creatures. Well, dung beetles may not be quite as impressive navigationally as the desert ant, but they do something very interesting. They gather around piles of dung at night and they take chunks of dung and roll them into little spheres, turn them into little spheres and roll those spheres away from the dung pile as quickly as they possibly can. They need to do that because it's a very competitive business being a dung beetle and other dung beetles will mug beetles with ready-made balls of dung and take them away from them. So the dung beetles that have made a ball of dung have to get away as quickly as they can and that means crucially that they need to go in a straight line. They don't want to find themselves doubling back to where they'd started from. Well that may not sound like a very difficult task but it is quite challenging in complete darkness especially if like a dung beetle you're rolling a ball backwards in your hind legs often over quite rough terrain. Well Eric Warrant and Marie Dacker did some experiments and they discovered that one of the things that the dung beetles were doing was making use not of the light of the sun like the desert ant how could they during the night? Instead, they were making use of the polarised light of the moon to maintain a steady course. Well, that was remarkable enough, but then a few years later, they made an even more extraordinary discovery when they saw dung beetles rolling their balls in complete darkness, it seemed, before the moon had risen. And they wondered how that was possible. And they looked up at the beautifully unpolluted night sky on the edge of the Kalahari Desert with no light anywhere nearby and they could see the brilliant ribbon of the Milky Way and they looked at each other and they said is it possible that the dung beetles are actually using the Milky Way as a kind of compass? Well to cut a long story short the answer is yes. They did some wonderful experiments that involved putting little cardboard hats over the beetles eyes to prevent them seeing the Milky Way and they went all over the place and then they put them in a planetarium and moved the Milky Way around and sure enough they were able to show that the Milky Way was a crucial factor in dung beetle navigation. Eric Warrant has also done work with his colleagues on a, a migratory moth in Australia called the Bogong moth which goes every year for more than a thousand kilometres from Queensland down to the snowy mountains in New South Wales to spend the summer months in cool caves up on the mountain tops. It then returns uh, to Queensland at the end of the summer when it gets cool again. So how does the bogong moth find its way? Well I joined Eric and his team on a memorable expedition to the snowy mountains while I was working on the book and we had some great times up in the middle of the night high in the mountains with these astonishing starry skies above, above us with no light pollution of course and we did these experiments and it turns out that the bogong moth is a magnetic navigator it has a magnetic compass sense which enables it to set and maintain a course during the course of its nocturnal migratory flights and more recently they've discovered that, like the dung beetle, the bogong moth can also use the Milky Way, as well as landmarks, because it has very, very good night vision. So there's another extraordinary insect navigator. But you're probably wondering, if we're talking about animal navigation, why haven't I mentioned birds? Because, of course, they are probably the most famous and prodigious navigators of all. Think of the Arctic terns, which fly literally from one end of the world to the other and back every year. Recent tracking experiments have shown that Arctic terns can travel the best part of a hundred thousand kilometers in a single year. 
and the bar-tailed godwits that breed in Alaska fly right across the entire Pacific, 11,000 kilometres to New Zealand. And they do that without stopping. It's an astonishing feat. Well, a huge amount of work has been done on bird navigation over the last hundred years or so. And it turns out that birds, of course, have quite a, a variety of tools at their disposal. One of the most important is a star compass. Nocturnal migratory birds have a way of using the stars to work out where due north is. Now, unlike human beings who often use the position of the pole star to work out where due north is, birds, it turns out, actually seem to be able to track the rotation of the stars around the North Star, around Polaris. How they do this isn't very clear, but they plainly can do it. And again, experiments in planetaria have proven this to be the case. So birds, nocturnal birds at least, have a star compass. They also, some birds, have access to a sun compass, a time compensated sun compass again, rather like the desert ant. They can maintain a steady course by reference to the position of the sun, even though it's moving across the sky during the day. Many birds also seem to have a magnetic compass sense, though exactly how this works is one of the great mysteries on which a huge amount of work is currently going on. And there are also other interesting clues. It looks as if some birds make very good use of their sense of smell. In fact, there is a strong train of evidence that homing pigeons make use of their sense of smell to find their way home, even when they've been displaced maybe two or three hundred kilometers and taken to a place they've never ever visited before. This is still controversial, but there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest that smell is very important to pigeons and other birds, uh, like shearwaters and uh, other oceanic birds. Another theory is that they may be making use of very, very low frequency sounds, infrasound, uh, to enable them to find their way back to their home lofts. The jury is still out on some of these things, but there's a lot of fascinating research going on. And birds, uh, though a lot is understood, birds still remain quite mysterious. Turning to a completely different kind of animal, let's look at reptiles and in particular marine turtles. Now marine turtles are famous for their ability to return to their native beach, the place where they were hatched from the egg uh, to, to lay their own eggs in the case of females. And during the interval, which may be a period of 10 or 15 years, they may travel right round an entire ocean basin. So how do they navigate round an ocean basin and find their way back to those beaches? Well, another scientist whom I interviewed, Ken Lohman, uh, has spent 30 or more years studying that, and he's come up with some amazing results which indicate that some turtles certainly make use of the Earth's magnetic field to track their position and to set an appropriate course to find their way back home. Again, you'll have to read the book to find out more about it, but it also looks as if they may well be able to locate the beaches where they were born by the magnetic characteristics of those beaches. So it could be that they're actually, as they say, imprinting on the those native beaches, natal beaches, and returning to them with the help of the Earth's magnetic field. Probably other factors like smell are involved as well, but that remains to be clarified. Now, I don't want to give the impression that uh, all the mysteries of animal navigation have been solved. That is very, very far from the truth. As you will see if you read my book, I include lots of examples of mysteries. And one of the great mysteries, which fascinates me as, a, as an ocean-going yachtsman, is how do the great whales, like humpback whales, navigate across thousands of miles of open ocean, something they can do with great precision. They've been shown to migrate from the waters around Antarctica to the breeding grounds uh, in the 
waters of the tropics going in an almost straight line and with great accuracy to particular uh, groups of islands where they typically rear their young. Well, nobody actually knows how they do this. It's a profound mystery. And of course, it's difficult to do experiments on, on whales. So we can only speculate, but it may be that they too use the Earth's magnetic field. It may be that they use uh, their sonar in some way, their acoustic navigational system, um, but we don't know. There are so many unsolved mysteries out there that uh, there's a lot plainly that we still have to learn. But I hope if you get to reading this book, you will share my sense of astonishment at the abilities that our fellow creatures display. And one of the reasons I wrote the book actually was to remind people that we are surrounded by natural wonders, natural wonders that in many cases are under grave threat as a result of the actions that we humans are taking. So climate change, the indiscriminate use of pesticides, there are lots and lots of things that we are doing to threaten the survival of some of these astonishing animal navigators that I describe. And I think it's also important for us to reflect on what we're doing to ourselves, because since GPS arrived on the scene just 20 or so years ago, we have become more and more heavily reliant on these electronic gadgets to enable us to find our way around. And of course, GPS is a technological wonder. It's extremely valuable. But I do worry, and I'm not the only one, that as we become more and more dependent on these gadgets and turn our backs on the traditional tools of navigation that our ancestors relied on, the ability to look to the stars, to the sun, uh, to learn routes by memorizing landmarks and so forth, as we do that, we are not only cutting ourselves off more and more from the natural world, which is a great source of nourishment for our souls, uh, but we're also endangering our own ability uh, to, to navigate uh, by natural means. And that may be a very bad thing. In fact, some neuroscientists whom I've spoken to think that it's possible that the parts of the human brain that permit us to navigate using our senses rather than gadgetry will shrink if we don't exercise them and that may indeed make us more vulnerable in the event that we fall victim to illnesses like Alzheimer's. Well this remains to be seen but I am quite certain that we should continue to exercise our navigational skills as often as we could and not rely too heavily on those gadgets. Anyway, I hope you'll buy my book and enjoy reading it. And if you do, by all means, tell me and look me up on uh, my website, davidbarryauthor.org. Thanks so much for listening. Goodbye.